Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a project we've been working on for a company called Obermeyer, um, where we focus on building a website that facilitated sales for both their uh, consumer and business um, customers. Um, my name is Mark Dodgson. Uh, I live in a little town called Ancaster, which is in Ontario, Canada. It's about uh, 45 minutes um, south of Toronto. And I work as uh, a user experience strategist and designer at um, a company called BlueSpark. And so BlueSpark is uh, a distributed design and digital shop. So um, we focus on building large scale uh, digital projects, primarily with uh, open, source uh, open source technology. So a lot of Drupal projects that we're working on. And it's offered us the ability to work um, on some interesting projects in uh, the higher ed library and e-commerce spaces. Um, and as you can see by our map, we have um, employees in nine countries and five different time zones. Um, we've also been really fortunate to work with uh, a number of really great organizations like Red Hat, uh, TripAdvisor, Stanford University, uh, UCLA, uh, to name a few. And, uh, and of course, we're working with um, Obermeyer, um, who we're going to talk to you about today. Um, so a little background, Obermeyer is um, um, an, an Aspen-based winterwear company that was uh, started back in 1947 by a guy named Klaus Obermeyer, uh, who actually still runs the company to this day. And as a company that got started long before the internet, they actually built uh, relationships with um, their dealers, which has ultimately led to their success. Um, but because of those relationships, it's actually led to some interesting um, conversion workflows online. So my goals for today is to um, offer an overview of the Obermeyer uh, project, um, highlight some of the challenges we've faced uh, doing this project, and then offer some insight into the tools that we've been do, um, using to make design and development decisions. So I'm going to give you the Coles Note version of the Obermeyer history. Um, they started uh, in the early 2000s by just building out a, a content management system. Um, but as they needed e-commerce, um, they built out an e-commerce platform. Then they needed inventory management. Um, then they need built on a CRM. Um, and then it was email newsletters and social media, and you get the picture. They started building on so much stuff that they ended up with so much technical debt that it made it difficult for them to, uh, to move forward. And having recently, um, you know, uh, investing in a comprehensive ERP system to manage their uh, inventory and supply chain ma uh, processes, it actually, uh, they ended up with three user-facing sites that were, um, were in, bro in a broken state. Um, so at a really high level, um, when we took over the project, they had a B2C site that was running uh, Drupal 6. Uh, they had a VIP site, which is like a loyalty program site, uh, which, which was also running Drupal 6. And then they had a business um, B2B site that was uh, being facilitated through um, a third-party SaaS system. So after um, a thorough discovery phase with the Obermeyer team, uh, we decided to consolidate all three sites onto the Drupal platform and uh, facilitate sales using Drupal Commerce. Um, and this gave us the benefit of maintaining a single site um, and also being able to reuse design components across the three uh, for a more consistent user experience. Um, we also suggested at the time, uh, again, going from Drupal 6 to doing the upgrade from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8, uh, which at the time was very early. I think it was only out for a couple weeks, so there was a number of challenges kind of along the way um, re related to that. Um, but that was done in an effort to, you know, offer them the most up-to-date system to kind of future-proof their investment. So it's important to understand that they have three very distinct uh, purchasing groups. Um, and each of these, and this kind of presented some challenges while um, integrating Drupal Commerce and where the user experience needed to be uh, designed in a way to facilitate sales regardless of, uh, of the use case. So they had a, a B2C um, site, so the consumer-facing site which facilitates uh, sales actually through third-party third retailers. So you're not actually checking out on, um, on their site. So this is, and I'll get into more detail about that. Um, then their VIP site is, um, facilitates um, sales through a traditional kind of e-commerce fashion where you can check out product directly from their, their website. And then they have uh, business customers that uh, facilitate purchases through, um, through the exact same site and the same catalog, uh, but are billed with a PO, so there's no cash transaction. So I'm going to just walk you through um, these in a little bit more detail. So for the B2C, the per, uh, B2C purchasing, um, they actually have a, uh, a workflow that we had actually never seen before. Um, they don't allow, their business model doesn't allow for direct to consumer sales. Um, so when you went onto their site before, uh, before we took over the project, 
Um, you would find a product that you were interested in. Um, you would select a color for that product. You would select a size for the product. And then what you would get is um, a list of dealers in the form of logos uh, that were supposed to have that product in stock. And so then from there, you would select the dealer uh, and you would be directed to that dealer's website to check out the final product. So essentially, this shopping cart experience is a single product ordering system, which is not really great for a company that sells matching outfits. Uh, if you wanted to go and buy a matching pant or a hat or gloves, you had to actually go back to the Obermeyer site and go through the entire process again. So we slightly modified it in the sense that we built in um, a My Cart page where they can add product to a, a cart um, like you would expect. And then based on that, you would take them from their My Cart page and then um, select uh, the dealer that they want to check out with. So the idea is we're taking those single item sales up to um, multiple item sale orders. Another area that required um, improvement was the handing off to the retailers' uh, websites. So by taking a look at the data from their partners, um, the retail partners, we started to see um, lots of patterns of cart abandonment. Um, so they would get over there and they would leave the site. So one of the awkward workflows before consumers is that um, you would select a retailer for checkout and they wouldn't actually realize that they were being directed to that retailer's, white, uh, that retailer's website. So from a user experience uh, perspective, it needed to be clear um, you know, what was happening. Um, so we actually ended up building a completely fictitious uh, transfer window that displays for a few seconds. Um, and this just gives the user a little bit more detail about what's actually happening. Um, so that when they landed on the dealer's site, it wasn't quite uh, such a jarring experience. The VIP section, it essentially translates to um, friends and family pricing, uh, or, um, but more importantly is really for the sales associates, so sales associates that are pushing their product on the sales floor. Um, they wanted to give them discounts, so they actually uh, have cards that they hand out with a VIP URL and uh, a discount, and that user can then log into the site, like create an account, they have to watch an introductory video, so getting a little bit of education in there. Um, and then they're able to access the same catalog as the B2C customers, but with that discounting uh, pricing. And although the uh, VIP section required some interesting ways to facilitate discounts, it's actually been the most straightforward to implement because it's, uh, it's direct sales from the website. B2B um, purchasing. So facilitating sales through um, for both consumers and sales associates is relatively easy because they have similar buying patterns. Um, the only difference really is that, uh, you know, from a, an actual um, purchasing standpoint is that the sales associates are getting a discounted price um, once they're logged in. Trying to facilitate um, B2, uh, B2B sales on the same site becomes significantly more, um, you know, complex because they, ha they buy in bulk and they have more complex needs in terms of how they purchase product. Um, so based on, um, the business customer's user rule, we actually uh, add the bag, uh, remove the add to bag button that was on the top left by the, uh, the title. And um, we give them a form that gives them a lot more control over adding uh, multiple variations of product to, um, to their, uh, their cart. They can add uh, multiple uh, sizes, different colors. And then and we have some persuasive patterns in there as well where we're um, showing stock level levels that are getting low in an effort to hopefully uh, get other deals to buy them as they see that they're running out of stock. So one of the interesting things we learned through Discovery was um, the way dealers actually purchase product for their uh, retail locations. Um, we actually hadn't considered that they, um, they might have multiple lo uh, retail locations. They might have uh, six or pl uh, six plus uh, locations. So um, it turns out that the dealer um, that the dealers purchase product for each of the retail locations individually and actually have budgets set for each location. Um, so on the old site, uh, that what dealers were doing was they would open up multiple tabs and add product to carts for those multiple tabs and try to order for each of those locations, but that broke um, a lot of times and people would lose their orders and things like that. Um, so what we've done is we've actually built, um, we built a thing called work in progress orders where we store multiple shopping carts at the same time. So any retailer that has multiple locations can create carts and, um, and store them and save them and they can go back to them multiple times. We've even uh, built in duplicating um, those carts too so they reorder things over and over again. Um, so this is something we're really excited about and where Drupal Commerce's uh, flexibility has really kind of helped us out. 
One of my favorite features is, um, is the ability for merchandisers to actually create uh, merchandising boards or lookbooks. Um, so we heard from our client and a, m a number of their dealers that merchandisers would add product to the shopping cart just to see what the product looked like together. Um, so we created merchandising boards as a way to offer these merchandisers, merchandisers the ability to assemble product on a board um, that might look good together on the sales floor. So they can name their board, um, they can add a description, they can add product, they can move the product around on the board. Um, and in addition to the customization features there, uh, merchandisers will be able to share these boards with key decision makers within the organization and then turn those um, boards into orders. Um, so we're hoping that adding this functionality will increase the overall product sales um, uh, by simplifying a process that was a little bit uh, kludgy. So there's always going to be um, challenges uh, on a project of this size, uh, but it's important to plan and risk manage uh, through them. Um, aside from the technical challenges, we knew that facilitating all three um, purchasing user roles would be difficult. We've definitely had some major challenges um, trying to clarify the B2C uh, experience and, and simplifying the, the business experience. Um, and that's just, we want a, a much more streamlined user experience there. Um, fortunately, we've had a number of usability methods to help us um, through many of the challenges we've faced on this project. So I want to start by defining what a conversion is because it's actually different for the site. And I'm going to focus on consumer because we just launched the B2B stuff so we don't really have a lot of the data there. But um, so I'm going to focus on consumer stuff. So a conversion in, in this case is um, a transactional value that we pass on to the retailer site. So if you buy a jacket for $200 and end up on the retailer site to purchase it, that transactional value becomes our, um, our conversion. And sadly, due to the complex nature of uh, the old site in terms of how conversions were being tracked, we didn't have all of the ideal baseline um, data that we needed to make good decisions moving forward. And this is where things became pretty interesting for us. Uh, we worked really hard to develop a site that was um, easy for customers to purchase from, taking into consideration that, um, that unusual checkout process. Um, again, the old, the old site only allowed for single item sales, so we introduced that, that the ability to do multiple item sales um, through that. So unfortunately, when we launched, uh, the conversions were pretty horrific. Um, so we launched in, uh, in last year um, in week 39, um, and we were down about $250,000 um, from the same time period uh, in the previous year, which was only in a, a period of a couple of weeks. Um, and that number was being pulled from um, retailer locations and analytics. It was being pulled in from a lot of the locations, so we didn't actually didn't know the, uh, the overall number. Um, so. Traffic was down about 30% to the, to the site, um, but that even wouldn't have accounted for the, the decrease in conversions. Um, so after the panic subsided, we tried to understand, you know, what was causing this dramatic de decrease in conversions? Um, we were thinking, you know, was it sticker shock? Because now they, you know, their customers were used to buying a single order of product, and now they're seeing multiple and the total and then being sent off to the retailer site. Um, was it that, that moment because uh, that jarring experience between um, you know, going from the Obermeyer site to the, the retailer site? We weren't really sure. And so, as with all project, uh, projects, you want to have really good uh, baseline data to have an understanding you know, where the project was before you launched a new site or a new feature. And again, we didn't have that. So we started reevaluating um, how we could get the site to a point um, before our launch, so before we took over, in an effort to kind of move the site forward using um, a number of usability um, tests. So after a number of discussions, we, um, we decided to implement the old e-commerce model on the new platform. So we, uh, so we were ensuring some, you know, building some historical data that we were told was working well. Um, so this was a reactionary measure, it was a reactionary move, and definitely not one we would normally uh, recommend. However, we were under a lot of pressure to fix this problem. Um, so we hid the ability to um, add the bag, right, so doing the multiple item sales, and we um, introduced their old model, which is if you select a size and a color, you get the logos. So we've gone back down to single item sales. So not ideal, but here's what happened. We had near identical, near identical traffic from one week to the next, um, but we saw an 8% increase in, in conversions. And so this was huge for us. We were like uh, baffled as how, to, how reducing functionality could actually increase conversions. Um, we even went and, and started looking at the average order, and the average order went from $306 down to $170, which would be expected because we were going from single um, multiple item sales back down to single item sales. 
And it turns out that we overlooked one key feature um, that we hadn't even considered before this project, and that was that we saw an average drop in 10 to 15 degrees in temperature in key markets for their product um, because they sell winter wear. And it just happened, bad luck, that we launched the feature <laughs> reducing the functionality on a week when it got cold. So this was our aha moment. We started thinking about factors that could play into the sales process and, and how we could start to monitor these factors um, to make sure that we don't uh, have them happen again in the future. Um, so we've actually now built out a tool that plugs into our analytics to show weather patterns um, and transactional values on a session level. So we actually tag every user um, that visits the site with the weather from their location. So we get the high and low temperature, uh, whether it's sunny, rainy, um, if it's snowing, um, and it gives us a little bit more insight into what's going on. So this is um, hopefully going to help us make better decisions in the future, or at least help us to understand what's going on uh, when there is a downturn. So the lesson learned for us is don't, um, don't forget to, uh, to keep an eye on the external factors. So for the Obermeyer project, weather was a big one. Um, ebbs and flows in the economy. Other ones that affected us uh, at the launch was um, less, users to the uh, less users to the site because of an actual industry downturn. So uh, many of their uh, customers and dealers uh, experienced a 10 to 15% decrease in sales across the board in 2016. Um, less users, um, less visitors because of uh, slowed marketing efforts. So Obermeyer had actually slowed all their marketing efforts because we were launching the new site. They wanted to wait till it was up. Um, and then also we launched pre-season, so a lot of product wasn't actually available yet online, which also killed uh, conversions a bit. So although the shock of the, um, you know, the initial shock uh, was pretty hard to take, and, and the, uh, you know, those <laughs> losing $250,000 in that short of, uh, short of time was pretty scary, um, we've actually made, um, worked very hard to make iterative uh, changes over this on the site. So things like improving the, the design and the programming side of things, optimize the current site, um, tried to get it to, to run faster. Um, we've improved the ab above the fold content and calls to action uh, where possible. And what we're finding is that many of the improvements, improvements that we've been making when those external factors were playing a role, um, now that things have picked up and marketing is better and, and traffic is better, um, that we're now starting to reap the, the benefits of that. So in week 39, we actually ended up getting, uh, seeing a 1.52% um, conversion rate um, to 5.31% in week 48, and then we closed out 2016 with a 7.34% uh, conversion rate. Um, it's gone up and down a bit, um, but it's been pretty steady in terms of how it's uh, been increasing. So how do we make our design and development decisions? Well, um, we do a, a lot of A-B testing. Um, I'm sure most of you know what this is, but for those of you who don't, uh, it's a way of comparing two versions of a web page or app um, and putting them against each other to see which one converts better. So in this example here, we actually uh, were testing whether um, showing the um, sizes as buttons uh, compared to sizes as a drop-down would convert better, and they actually did. So the, the version on the site now is the, um, the sizing as buttons. Um, we're running A-B tests using Google Analytics, uh, sorry, Google Experiments, and the benefit of using Google Experiments is that it offers us the ability to um, A-B test a percentage of the traffic going to the site. Um, so essentially we're not losing tons of those conversions while we're testing. So for example, we can test, um, we can A-B test on 10% of the traffic, and then Google splits it up 50-50. Um, so we're about seven months into the launch for the consumer um, side of things. And we continue to test and iterate. Um, later this month, we're actually beginning a series of A-B tests to reintroduce that original cart feature that we reactively removed, um, and a number of other improvements to uh, help increase the overall conversion. So here's some tests now. So the, this, one, this is what's live right now, so it's the old, um, the old sales model. Uh, the next test is going to remove the logos and put in a button that says buy online now. Because we've seen a lot of uh, confusion uh, with uh, users, and I'll, I'll show you a, a recording in a moment. Uh, of users like not understanding that the logo is actually a button. Um, so by going to this route, um, the buy online now will then launch a, um, a pop-up modal that they can select their dealer to check out. Once this test is done, the next one is to take that buy online now button and change it to the add to bag. So then we're taking it back to multiple item sales. Um, and then it would go through the traditional cart feature and then from the cart they would select their dealer to check out. So it's an unusual checkout process but we're trying to get back to that multiple item sales, um, multiple item uh, sales there. 
So A-B testing is, um, you know, is it ensures that we're man uh, maintaining the sales while gaining an understanding of what's actually affecting it, um, you know, affecting the conversions, good or bad. As I'm sure many of you are using, uh, we use Google Analytics for a lot of our insights. Um, so we've even tweaked it a bit to make sure that we're, um, you know, tr tracking the things that actually matter to this particular project. Uh, conversion rates is a big one that we, we uh, manage, of course. But transactional value by country is pretty important for us. Um, transactional value sent to the dealers, so we know if we've sent $10,000 or $100,000 to a specific dealer, it's broken out by dealer. Um, transactional value by device, uh, desktop, mobile, or uh, tablet. Um, transactional value by browser, which actually was pretty important for us back in November. 60% um, of their traffic is on desktop Safari. Uh, but it was the lowest converting browser, and it turned out that it was um, a JavaScript bug. So by fixing that bug, we were able to, um, to make that the highest converting browser now. Um, we also keep an eye on session by individuals for marketing optimization and uh, by gender for marketing optimization. Uh, let's face it, uh, usability testing can be expensive, um, and, but the harder part is actually selling it to key stakeholders. Um, so, you know, user feedback is important to get us um, out of our design and development bubbles. Uh, and although setting up a focus group and in-person user testings are often valuable, um, the cost to implement them is a little bit scary to your stakeholders. Um, so it's important to remember that our friends and family are real users uh, for the most part. Um, it actually sounds pretty simple, but we actually, uh, we actually tried this with our own team and it revealed um, areas of concern when we ran scenarios with them. So we gave scenarios out to our, our friends and family. And it was interesting that um, a number of the concerns that were raised were consistent amongst all of our friends and family. So here's a couple of things that, we, that came out of just asking, asking them for a little bit of uh, help. On the uh, far left one, we have thumbnails with uh, the large image above. And the idea is that you click the thumbnail and you get the large version. Um, but on ours, you have to hold down on the thumbnail uh, a little bit for it to launch, which is not obviously ideal. Um, and Obviously, you see what happens. It wants to save it to the camera roll. So that was a bug that we were able to fix pretty quickly by asking for help. The one on the far right is a light box image that pops up. But we had the image scaling to the width of the image. So if the image actually exceeded height-wise the um, device size, you couldn't close the image because the close button was hidden. Um, so again, just by asking our friends and family for a little help, it, it uncovered some seemingly obvious uh, things that we should have caught while we were building it. Um, what users say they do and what they actually do are often uh, quite different. Um, and as a result, we've actually um, introduced anonymous user recordings that we can turn on and off as needed. Um, so I thought I would share uh, three different recordings, two failures and one success one to kind of show what we see and how we're using them. So this is a recording uh, and we can turn them on, uh, on and off as needed. Um, and this is a user that's trying to buy a product, uh, that these pants here, and so they don't realize that you have to select the size to get, to get a button to check out with. They finally select the size, they get the logos, and they don't realize that the logos are buttons. So they click three times on the actual title before exiting the page. So you can see from this recording that they're confused by the logos, they don't understand their buttons, um, and they are also confused by how they, they need to select a size before they can get a dealer for checkout. So this is one, one failure and one uh, area that we're, we're trying to reintroduce that, um, that new button that's a little more clear. Um, here's a mobile one. And so the mobile one here is, again, keeping in mind that a user has to select a size and a color to check out a product. Well, this is uh, a toque. I don't know if you call it in the US. but. Uh, it's one size fits all, right? So you can't actually select a size, which means you never get a dealer, which means you can't buy that product online. So again, by having these user recordings, we're able to uncover uh, quick little bugs and, and make fixes on those. So this user couldn't purchase that product. Um, and it's good to find those failures um, because we're also, we can implement uh, changes pretty quickly. But it's also good to uncover things that are successful. So here's a user. Um, this is on the VIP site, so this is a user shopping around, um, and we had just, re -intro just introduced um, a recommendation engine. Um, so it was neat to see that this user is shopping around for a jacket, um, they get to the cart page, and then we show the recommendations, and it's neat to see the user actually um, interacting with those recommendations and adding those uh, particular products to, um, to their bag. Um, so again, it highlights the things that are also working. 
On the right hand side, there's a column there. Um, and what that's giving us is a lot of detail about what's going on from that user. So we can get what, what uh, country they live in, what device they're using, uh, what operating system and version of operating system, uh, what browser and version of browser. Um, and so what we've found is that um, when we're running into bugs, we're, we create tickets in JIRA and we can attach these recordings to the ticket and our developers can then fix these bugs uh, a lot more quickly and efficiently because they understand exactly what's going on. So it's important to remember that um, things are going to fail. Um, that's the nature of software. Uh, and so having good customer, um, you know, customer friendly fail points um, is good to help kind of reduce customer frustration. Um, so here's a couple that we've introduced on, on the Obermeyer site. So the 404 page, we put the content you're looking for no longer exists. We have a 1980s ski jacket. And we've got, um, for authenticated users, uh, the course you're trying to take lies outside the patrol area. So trying to keep that theming going throughout uh, the entire experience. I really wanted to talk about process because we have a two-tier estimation process where we go from wire framings and, and sketches uh, and into the comping and then development. Unfortunately, there's no time for that. Um, if you're interested in process, uh, my colleague is doing a talk tomorrow at 1045 in room 314 and it, she talks for an hour about how changing um, our estimation process took our project endgame from WTF to FTW. And it's, it's very thorough in terms of how we um, how we do a run a project from start to finish and how it's transparent for our client and how they are involved in the whole um, estimation process. Um, so here's what we've learned. Uh, have good baseline data. Again, we didn't have ideal uh, baseline data, but we've gone back to make sure we, we get that. Um, be proactive, not reactive, if possible. Um, understand the metrics that matter to your particular project. Um, consider external factors, so in our case it was weather and, uh, and marketing efforts and, and low stock, um, and definitely test your assumptions. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. I'm open to some questions.